Amen. Take your Bibles down, open up to Mark chapter 9. Guys, I think this is week 30 in the Gospel of Mark, and we're in chapter 9. Yeah, is it? 30 weeks to get this far. You guys obviously aren't listening very fast, so I'm going to do my best to cover some ground today. We might go through 10 verses today. It's going to be a, a marker stone. Check it out. Look at verse 14 of Mark chapter 9. It says, and when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Big fight was going on there in northern Israel. It's still going on right now, Lord have mercy. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him greeted him. I love the transition here. Jesus comes down now the mountain of transfiguration. He's been up there, we don't know for how long, with Peter, John, and James. The other nine disciples were down below, kind of keeping camp, waiting for them to return. Can you imagine what was going through their mind? Checking their watches, where's Jesus at? What's he doing? And as they're checking their watches, wondering where Jesus is at, all of a sudden a fight erupts. Contention and disruption and division. This is not a fun story. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes back down the mountain of transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. You'll remember what they were doing up there, don't you? Jesus was transfigured in their presence. Peter began to talk and say dumb things and offer his assistance in making three tabernacles. And the cloud of God's presence, the Shekinah glory, overshadowed them. And the voice, oh, thank you for the voice, interrupted Peter and said, zip it, Pete. That's why they call him Peter Piper. He's always piping up, making silly things. Zip it, Pete. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And immediately the Bible says that the cloud disappeared. The transfigured Jesus refigured into his normal self. Look at verse eight, actually. Check out verse eight of the text we just read. It says, suddenly when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. What, what's going on here? Jesus was transfigured. Elijah and Moses show up. They're talking about, Luke tells us, his death, his upcoming exodus when he leaves this world. And all of a sudden, though, this transfiguration, I believe this is who Jesus really was, that the miracle wasn't the showing of his transfiguration. The ongoing miracle was the covering of his glory, was the holding back. And in that moment, this is who Jesus really was. I actually believe at this moment, you know what Jesus could have done? He could have went with Elijah and Moses right back to heaven. He was born perfect. He had lived perfect. He could have been raptured right then and there. And I'm so glad he didn't. You know why? Because in verse 8, it says everything disappeared. And there's Jesus looking at him again in his plain self. Jesus is up on the mountain. How many of you guys want to stay up on this mountain the rest of your life? Like, this is so cool. Peter wanted to be there. Like, this is rad. He can see down the mountain. That looks like they're fighting down there. I don't want anything to do with that. And Jesus says, well, that's what I came for. This is my glory. This is the future. But right now, we have to go down the mountain. There are skirmishes. There are people in duress and distress. There are battles. There are confusions and contentions right now. And if you're like me and you're like Peter, you're like a normal person, like, I don't know, I kind of don't want anything to do with that kind of a life. The Lord says, that's why I've given you armor. That's why I've given you my presence. That's why I've given you my orders. In this world, you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Sounds like you just said be of good cheer. Right after he said there's gonna be contentions and difficulties. And I believe this is why it's imperative that we spend time in Jesus' presence, seeing him high and lifted up, basking and preparing ourselves for the chaos that awaits you. Lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls and quit. Don't raise your hands. But anybody ever feel like they want to just quit too much it's too hard the difficulties are real some days are great some days you don't want to quit some days everything's great your marriage is great and your health is great and your job is great and your ministry is great and the, everything's great some days are like that write those days down those are what i call selfie days you take a selfie to remember that day other days you're like whoa this is intense and it's in days like this the transfiguration that we behold him and gaze upon him. And we too, listen, we learned this last week, are transformed from glory to glory the more we spend with him, the more we look upon him. The contrast is true. The less time you spend in this book, 
The less time you spend in fellowship, the less time you spend worshiping, praying, interceding, the less time, the less transformation, the less preparation of the heart you'll have. As a matter of fact, I'm teaching the book of Acts tomorrow. I'll probably get through two chapters. The first day is always very disappointing. Two chapters. And then the second day, I try and get a little ahead, and I teach two more chapters. Then we're all in big trouble. But in fact, chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4 leads us to chapter 4, right around verse 13. And in chapter 4, verse 13, the book of Acts, Peter and John, same homies right here. They're in trouble. Remember that story? They're in trouble with the Sanhedrin, and they're looking at them. And the Bible says that they're looking at these two dudes, and they realize and recognize that they are untrained and uneducated. The Greek word is idiotos. It's where we get our word, idiots. But they realize these guys are just idiots. They're from Galilee. These guys are from Depot Bay. These guys are from Lincoln. These guys are from Lincoln City. You know, these, who are these guys? But then they make a conclusion. Listen, your observation continues. They conclude they've been with Jesus. What's your claim to fame? Even as we are worshiping and singing and, and I'm preparing to drive and, and, and live the rest of my life, my claim to fame, my foundation, my strength, my identity has nothing to do with me has everything to do with Jesus Christ and him crucified, Jesus Christ and him glorified, Jesus Christ and his kingdom coming. And when you know that, when I know that, well, then all the skirmishes and all the blemishes and all the stuff that happens in your life up here, you won't be taken for a ride. You won't be scandalized. And you might be just like John and Peter and Luke, an idiot, an untrained, uneducated person, but your identity is in Jesus and Jesus alone. And I love how Jesus, when he was transfigured, verse eight again shows us that he was right there with them. Because you know why Jesus came? To save these guys. He came to come off of Mount Hermon, the Mount of Transfiguration, and instead of staying on that mountain where Peter wanted to stay in his glory, he said, no, we gotta go down this mountain so I can continue my mission and then go up the next mountain. What was the next mountain? Mount Calvary, where your salvation would be purchased. I didn't come just to be glorified and to leave you, Peter. I came to die for you. All of this is God's preparation of their heart. All of this is God's preparation for his boys, for his church, that they would find themselves being ready for the battle that lies ahead of them. And Jesus here, knowing these things, looks at Peter and John and James And he says, let's now go down the mountain. Look at verse 14 again. Let's study the text. We were in the last couple of verses for a couple of weeks. Look at verse 14. It says, and when he came to the disciples, he saw a great dispute, a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Guys, don't be surprised that after a big event, after a milestone moment, after a camp or a conference or a seminar or a retreat or even after church. Man, that was so good. Wasn't worship so good today? Wasn't the tournament so good yesterday? Don't be surprised right after a banner moment coming right down to a bummer moment immediately. He met him, Peter, James, and John coming down, and Jesus instructed them, let's not talk about what just happened up on the mountain. Like, what? We don't get to tell all our homies what just happened. He's like, no, they're not gonna like that story right now. They're kind of dealing with stuff, and they come right down, and I'll tell you what, man, this can surprise you. This can mess with you. I remember on some of the biggest moments of my life, coming back from Israel the very second time, very first time, whatever the time, coming back, it was such a radical trip and the journey home was so difficult and so hard. There were so many problems that most of us forgot what had happened on the trip to Israel. And the devil wants to steal your joy and I don't wanna become too honest, transparent, or vulnerable, but I remember on my wedding day, the happiest day of my life, my wife and I got married and just about 90 minutes after we got married, she was crying. Somebody was super mean to her in the car. I don't even know what he was thinking. It was me. I wasn't super mean to her, but I was just insensitive enough to her. I was like, why is my wife crying? I've been married 90 minutes. Ah! Pray for us. <laughs> 23 years into it now, getting out, yeah, still going. Listen, don't be surprised. They come down the mountain and there's a fight. There's things going on because the devil wants to stop your growth. Listen, stop your progress and stop your mission. These guys just came down, they saw all kinds of cool things, they were given instruction, and when those fights and contentions and disruptions happen, the devil just wants you to quit, he doesn't care how. He could either bless you and you become affluent and distracted in the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches, that's what Jesus said, or it could be all the chaos and the ruts and the struts and the things that get in our way, the devil doesn't care. He can make you bad, he can make you busy, just be careful. Don't be surprised how the devil wants to stunt your growth. 
Don't believe the lies that he brings to you. Look at verse 15. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and ran to him and greeted him. I like this. During this contention, Jesus shows up. People start running to him. Let's start doing that. Let's start doing that when everything gets weird, when contention arises. Let's just bring it to Jesus. We're gonna see this a couple different times. A guy's gonna bring his son to Jesus. Jesus is gonna say, bring him to me. Bring your problems to Jesus. I can't overstate that enough. What are you dealing with right now? Is it finances? Is it health? Is it relationships? Is it sin? Is it struggles? Distractions? Bring it to Jesus over and over and over again. Don't try and just wrestle it out yourselves. As a matter of fact, look at verse 16. It says, and when, and, and he asked the scribes and said, what are you guys discussing with them? Uh, and then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. And so I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. And then he answered and said, oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? I love this part. Bring him to me. Stop right there, eyes up here. This is so rad. Jesus now comes down. He sees the contention, which involves the nine disciples, the scribes who are kind of the rule keepers, but also the fight instigators, and then the crowd that needs help, including this dad that has a son that has a mute spirit in him, a demonic spirit that throws him down and around and has abused him since he was a young boy. And Jesus comes down and he sees his nine disciples being picked on and he gets into the fray. In the Greek here, we can tell Jesus is coming to the defense of his disciples, which makes me super happy that Jesus is ready to rumble and get in the fray when his boys are being attacked. How many of you guys, when you're being attacked or distracted or preyed upon by the enemy or the world, you kind of feel like you're alone. I sense that all the time, it's what I feel. I feel like I'm alone, like the Lord doesn't know, I don't know what's going on, I gotta fight this out on my own, not so. Jesus sees, he knows, and he comes down the mountain and immediately gets in the fray. And this is important, by the way, that you let Jesus be your defender because Jesus has full authority to defend you well. He has compassion and mercy to also defend you well. And he knows what is really going on in your heart and other people's hearts. How many of you guys get in fights or contentions or difficulties from time to time and you just wanna take matters into your own hand? Anybody wanna take matters into their own hand? You guys are the 8 a.m. crowd. You should all put your hands up. Yeah, we're the, we're the 8 a.m. crowd. Ah, you should probably let the Lord be your defender. Be, let the Lord be the one who cares for the things around you, lest you find yourself getting in the flesh. It says in verse 16 again, and then he asked the scribes, what are you disputing? Why are you disputing with them? And then one of the crowd answered him and told him what was going on. This guy, this dad, had brought his son to the disciples. We'll see this in the story to receive help and reprieve and mercy. And his disciples had tried to intervene and wasn't able to do so. This man knew and had heard about Jesus and Jesus had, had been on the scene and he needed this ministry and this healing from Jesus. And he finally hears that Jesus is there and now hope restores in his mind. Hope restores in his heart. How long had this guy suffered from childhood? We're gonna see that in just a few verses. But when he starts hearing that Jesus is there and the disciples in prayer, hope is born. And I just wanna speak that to somebody here this morning. Maybe you've been going through a season for a while. Maybe it's a year or two or 10. Somebody in your life has been taken hostage. Something in your life is not right where it needs to be. And the Lord would say to you, bring him to me. And when that hope is restored, especially for our kids, and right now there's a fight going on for the young people all over one of the reasons why God led us. I was gonna say one of the reasons why we started the school. We didn't start the school because we wanted to start the school. God started the school because God wanted to start the school. Husbands and wives and men and women go into education to be a part of the school system, to educate and to disciple, to be light and salt in the public school sector, homeschool, private school, camps and youth groups because God wants, I believe, us to have hope for this next generation, to fight for the people around us. Look what happens in verse 17. One of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son. He has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth and he becomes rigid. 
So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. Stop right there, eyes up here. Luke records a story, Mark records a story, and Matthew records a story. And they all use a little different vernacular to describe what was going on with this particular boy. Some use the word epileptic, and some talk about this muted spirit. But regardless of what's going on, we know that he has a mental illness. He has something going on in his mind, but it's demonically... um, Somebody's alarm going off. It's freaking me out. There it goes. Must have been a demon. Just kidding. I kid, I kid, I kid. This particular illness, though, we know has a spiritual component to it. Let me just say this at the front end. Not every mental illness has a spiritual component to it. Some mental illness is real mental illness. Okay, there's a mental imbalance. There's all kinds of health issues, and that's a real subject, a real uh, problem in our day and age. But if you're like me, you know people. Do they just need more prayer? Is there, is there a, a demon involved? Is there a spirit? Here we see that this is exactly what's going on. And I'm not gonna stand here this morning and pretend to know all the ins and outs of every situation, but I do know whether it's mental illness or a health imbalance or a chemical addiction or something like that, or it's a spiritual problem or a demon involved, we need to bring him to Jesus Christ. And in, according to this story, not just once, but until there is relief, until there is reprieve. And this particular dad hears about Jesus and he brings his son to the Lord in order that he might find himself helped. Look at verse 19. And he answered and said to them, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? And how, shall, how long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Interesting. We normally see Jesus as the kind messenger, the kind shepherd, the encourager. When I read this the first time, I was like, that's kind of mean. What's Jesus saying? Is he really mad at these guys for not being able to figure it out? And I instantly felt a little guilty for the areas in my life I haven't been able to figure it out. And let's go ahead and just sit in that for a minute. Jesus says, oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I labor with you? Haven't I taught you these things? And can you imagine saying, "Uh, I'm trying. Anybody in here trying? I'm trying. And yet let's just go ahead and own this. Let's go ahead and take this medicine. So here's the deal. The Lord will give the Holy Spirit over you to convict you. Now the devil will come along in your life right where you're at and he'll condemn you. The condemnation of the devil is not from God. You need to quiet that voice, you need to put that away, don't listen to that. That stinking thinking, that negativity that leads to depression and a distance between you and the Lord. But there will be a conviction from the Holy Spirit. He will come to you, he will come to me and say things like, Luke, shouldn't you be a little further along in your journey than you are? Because he loves me. Shouldn't you have figured these things out? Shouldn't you have pressed into this issue? Shouldn't you have more, not in a condemning way, And even saying this is hard in 2024 because we're in the participation trophy generation. I just showed up. Don't I get a blue ribbon? For sure, you know. Last place blue ribbon. There you go. Go stand with the champions. And we all expect to be treated like we did our best and we get the best. And then the reality is you reap what you sow. And Jesus here is not frustrated the same way you and I get frustrated with our athletes or with our students or with our kids when they're not learning and not growing, but Jesus here is showing his desire for us to press in. And maybe somebody's here this morning that doesn't need just another pat on the back and say, you're doing great, you're on the grace train, you know, God's greasy gravy's coming your way, you're gonna be just fine and he'll figure it out. Maybe some of you, maybe some of me need to say, hey, Luke, you should probably figure this out by now. It's time to fight. It's time to grow up. It's time to go deeper. I'm gonna read the red letters once again in verse 19. He answered them and said, oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? And then immediately, instead of leaving, Jesus says, bring it to me. Oh, that's so good. You ever had a boss or a coach or maybe a mom or dad hold you accountable to the things that you should be doing right? Bring up the things that you aren't doing or that you are doing wrong. And then immediately extend their arm of grace extend the heart of love, continue that bond of fellowship, saying, hey, let's move forward, though. And Jesus says, let's go ahead and bring him to me, which is exactly what the Lord asks for all of us when we have situations in our life. Bring your stuff to the Lord. As a matter of fact, uh, interesting that these scribes were fighting with the disciples. And the disciples, man, what's wrong with them? I don't know what's going on. Why, did, why weren't they able to heal this kid? We're gonna see in just a few verses here, Jesus is gonna say this one only comes out through prayer and fasting, teaching us a deep lesson. Evidently, the prayers of the disciples weren't accompanied by fasting and disciplines in that way. 
But it could have also been that they were making a mistake in bringing the son, in bringing this dad to the disciples, specifically and primarily. See, there is this disconnect that I think we need to go from horizontal to vertical within our church, within our counseling, within our meetings. I get people contact me all the time, Luke, I've got a marriage issue, and I've got a discipleship issue, and I've got a parental issue, and a financial issue, and issues are right, issues are going to happen. But when you just go unilaterally this way to disciples and to other people, you're missing the one who can actually touch you and change you and heal you. And my job is to talk to God on behalf of people and talk to people on behalf of God and to make that connection and to help people get up there. But wouldn't it be radical if all of us, instead of going to a disciple, man, I just gotta get to Pastor Luke or I gotta meet with that person or I gotta read that book, I gotta go to that service. If you and I all said, I just need to go to Jesus. I need to bring my family to Jesus. I need to bring my issue to Jesus. I need to go right to the spout where the blessings come out. I can't remember what day it was this week, but I came to the sanctuary by myself. Nobody else was here, and I was walking through the sanctuary, and I walked out the back doors, and I saw the little communion pack sitting there. It was just me and nobody else. And I thought to myself, I need to take communion. Not with the body of Christ like I do every Sunday. It's so fun. And I just sat in the back there, and it was a surreal moment. Just me and Jesus. Just Jesus. Is he enough? He's, but I'm busy, you're busy, we're busy, it's easier to connect with people and I connect with my family and my wife and my, 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 my kids and the staff and we're always seeing each other and pray. Hey, will you pray for me? Will you pray for me? We pray for each other, that's awesome. But Jesus here says, bring him to me. And maybe that was the big disconnect. Maybe that was where they weren't making that connection. I'm not sure. Look at verse 20. And then they brought him to him. And when he saw him immediately, the spirit convulsed him and he fell down on the ground and he wallowed foaming at the mouth, man. So he asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Stop right there, eyes up here. We're gonna see not only in this situation where the boy is brought to Jesus and he freaks out and is thrown on the ground. In just a few minutes, Jesus is gonna pray and it gets even worse. Have you noticed that sometimes things before they get better, they actually do get worse? It's crazy. Sometimes when you make an effort in your marriage or make an effort in your relationships, I'm gonna talk to this person, I'm gonna bring Jesus to the middle here and things actually get worse before they get better. This is surprising to me and sometimes it's Satan's effort to say, yeah, you're not gonna win this battle. You can't reconcile. You can't get better here. And instead of getting better, which you thought it was gonna get better, the demons in, uh, increase in their activity and there's all kinds of things that come up. I see this in marriage counseling. I see this in discipleship. I see this in accountability. I see this in my own life when I decide to make things different. And the devil oftentimes turns things up before the Lord is able to deliver and to restore. Let me just say this, don't quit. Don't give up. That might be the best advice you ever hear. Just DTNRT, do the next right thing. And TTP, trust the process. Just keep going. Yeah, but it's getting worse in my marriage. It's getting, and if the Lord has put his stamp of approval on certain things, such as marriage, such as raising children, such as being a believer, being a disciple, abstaining from the things of this world, all the things that God has said, yeah, I believe in those things. That's how you should live. Then if it's difficult to live in those areas, if there's a fight, hey, don't be surprised. Just keep doing it. Lord, I did the next right thing. It got super weird. <laughs> Good. Keep going. Well, they bring this boy to Jesus, and he throws himself down. Notice verse 22. He gives a little more personal testimony. I already read it. Often he's thrown them both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. I don't know what's really going on here. I wasn't there. I don't know what this looked like. We're gonna see in the very couple last verses, not in this text, but another uh, companion text, the word there is, is a wrestling word or a boxing word where the demon actually fights this guy. It's the very last, it's the knockout punch. It's kind of like the last takedown you would use in a term of wrestling to destroy your opponent. The TKO, it's what he uses here, the demon. This demon is plaguing this boy. And the dad gives testimony, says sometimes he throws him into the fire. Who? You mean the boy throws himself in the fire? The demon tries to destroy him, throws him in the water, tries to drown him? And again, I don't know what's going on here, but this is essentially suicide. This demon's trying to end this boy's life, and how does this work? I don't know. But I do know this. There is a battle within each one of our minds. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. 
And the Bible says to guard our minds, to be careful of the things around us because they'll plague you, they'll get into your mind, they'll sway you one way or another. All of the influences in this world, whether it's drugs or alcohol or influences of the world, they have an impact on what we do, how we think, what we say, how we live. And here we see this culmination. I don't know what happened to this boy, how this happened, if a door was opened up or if this was just the way that life went for him. I do know this, that we live in a day where there's a battle for our kids, there's a battle for our own mental health, a battle for our sanity. I did a little research last night. They say that in teenagers, the second uh, leading cause of death in teenagers is suicide. The second leading cause of death today is suicide. Over 20% of all teenagers have considered seriously taking their own lives 15% of uh, 18 and up to 35-year-olds have considered taking their own lives. I began to think about the darkness that must be upon somebody and think, I'm just gonna end it. I'm gonna take my, and I can't speak to that personally, but I know there are some here who can. And only Jesus can save us. Only Jesus can bring that light and hope into our lives and deliver us from that type of oppression. I would say this, though. Be careful. Be careful of the things you expose yourself to. Be careful of the things you involve yourself with. See, we, it's Halloween season. People are gonna be dressing up like devils and playing games and tarot cards and all kinds of weird stuff going on. Be careful of those things. Don't let yourself be taken down the road of the worldliness in this world and find yourself uh, opened up to what the devil wants to do in your life. Stand on guard. Well, here, this guy brings his son to Jesus Jesus, with compassion, asks him, how long has this been happening? And actually, he prays that very prayer in verse 22. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And then Jesus, verse 23, said to him, if you can believe all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father of the child uh, cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Stop right there, eyes up here. Man, Jesus here leading this father closer to himself. And if I'm honest, this text, Jesus is a little, not rough, but he's a little bit putting the weight back on them. He comes down the mountain, he sees what's going on. Why are you fighting with my disciples? What's going on here? Well, your disciples couldn't let this boy be healed. They didn't have the faith to do so. And Jesus rebukes his disciples. How long is it gonna be this way? How long shall I bear with you? And then this father asks for help. Can you heal my son? And Jesus essentially puts it back on him, says, hey, if anybody believes, that I can do these things. Anything's possible. Now, I am not of the camp that says if you have enough faith, the Lord will do whatever you want. There are some people that say you didn't get the miracle, you didn't get the prayer, you didn't get the request, you didn't get the answer because you didn't have enough faith. I would say, eh, to that type of theology. Okay, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You can't pray God into your will. You don't wanna pray God into your will. Lord, do what I want. (laughs) No, Lord, Lord, don't do what I want. Lord, give me the desires of my heart. Lord, would you give me the desires of your heart? Change my heart. And then you find yourself praying in accordance with God's will. And God says, that's the kind of faith that believes that I can do all things that will find himself, herself, receiving then the provision and the purposes and the power of God. And here's again the challenge. Do you want those things? Do you want God's will in your life? Do you really want God's will? And as you find yourself growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus, you realize, oh my gosh, I want his will. Again, verse 23, if you believe, all things are possible to him believe. And the father cried out, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. What a radical, humble prayer. Lord, I'm willing, (laughs) but I need help. I need help to take it to the next level. Look at what happens in verse 25. When Jesus saw the people come running, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to him, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you come out of him and enter him no more. What a radical prayer Jesus prays uh, for this young boy. He names him. They had all kinds of different superstitions back in those days. He was a deaf and dumb spirit, which means this boy couldn't talk. And in those days, the uh, exorcist of the day would want to learn the name name of the demon so they could cast that demon out with more authority and they weren't able to do that so they're all kind of hamstrung in this way jesus simply calls him a deaf and dumb spirit and then commands him to come out and to enter no more get out and don't come back that's a radical prayer 
Oftentimes, we fight against the ways of the flesh, the ways of the enemy, the ways of demons. We push those things up, but we don't bar the door no more. We don't change the locks. We don't put up the boundaries. We cast out the devil, but we don't make adjustments in our life. The Bible tells us in the book of James to resist the devil, and he'll what? And then what's the next verse say? Anybody know? There's more to the verse. Draw near to the Lord, and he'll draw near to you. It's a one-two combo. So often, though, we only do the one. You're all good at resisting the devil. Every single one of you are good at it. You're like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to open up that door. I don't want to taste that. I don't want to look at that. I don't want to say that. I don't want to think that. And you guys are good at it. And we can all resist it every single day. We say, no, 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 because the world's crazy. Do you know that the devil loves that? He flees, and he comes right back. He flees. You resist him. That's what it says. He'll come right back. He'll come back and he'll wear you down. And you could say no to sin and temptation early in the morning. Nope, 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 not gonna do that. Not, gonna, not, not doing it, not doing it. And the devil has to go. But he goes outside and he says, oh, I noticed they didn't lock the door. I'll be right back in. And the devil comes back. Jesus actually said the devil comes back with seven of his buddies that are even worse than him. And it feels spiritual to resist the devil. It feels like we're doing something right. Because you are. I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna say that. I'm not gonna think that. I'm not gonna go there. And the devil leaves. And yet James tells us, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And Here's where you win. Draw near to the Lord and he'll draw near to you. You have to seal the loop. You have to finish the fight. The devil will leave, but it's at this point that you must seek the Lord. It's at this point that you sweep the house and get it in order when the strong man is bound and cast out that you now invite the Holy Spirit back into your heart, back into your mind, back into your hands, back into your eyes, back into your relationship. And you say, Lord, would you come here? Get out, devil, and never come back. Why? Because it's occupied now. This is occupied land. The Holy Spirit's here. Again, I hope that makes sense to somebody who's struggling and maybe failing. Somebody who keeps fighting. I'm not going to be mad at my spouse. I'm not going to say it. 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 I'm going to say it. And when you invite the Holy Spirit in, after saying no to the flesh, no to the world, no to the devil, the real win is when you bring in the Holy Spirit to lock the door, to occupy the place, and to change your life. And Jesus here, I believe, casts this demon out and says, don't come back anymore. Powerful stuff. Well, then the Spirit, verse 26, cried out and convulsed him greatly and then came out of him, and he became as one who was dead. So many said, he's dead. Imagine being there. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. He wasn't dead. He just looked dead. And sometimes in our lives, man, it gets so bad. Or in the lives of the people that you're ministering to. Maybe you got some kids or grandkids. Some people, that marriage is dead. That relationship is dead. And the world would say, count them out. They're dead. And here, in this situation, no. It looks dead. But nothing is ever dead dead with Jesus. Nothing is ever too far gone for Jesus. And even though things look like they're dead, they're not. And I would encourage you, no matter what you're dealing with right now, no matter what you're going through, keep fighting. Keep going. Keep crying out to the Lord. As I already mentioned, it might get worse before it gets better. It might get ugly before it becomes beautiful once again. Jesus, verse 27, said, took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come back into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? I'm so glad they asked this question. The other nine are like, hey, that was kind of a crazy day. We missed you while you are up on the mountain of transfiguration. Glad you're back. We got in a big fight with a bunch of people, and we couldn't cast out the devils or any insight for us, anything going on. I wasn't there. I don't know what was going on. But Jesus rebukes them, and he gives them a teachable moment. Look at verse 29. So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Stop right there, eyes up here. I've got a few thoughts of why they couldn't cast out this devil with Jesus being absent. I don't necessarily know, but Jesus gives us the insight. We need to know that this kind comes out by prayer and fasting. Let's talk about that just quickly. Jesus uses the word genos, which is where we get our word genesis, in the word kind. He says this kind. And in so doing, Jesus is saying this particular demon is a different level. The Bible teaches us, not, not completely, but it does allude to the fact that there are different levels of demonic warfare, demonic influence, different categories of demons and devils. And Jesus evidently is saying, oh yeah, this one, this one was a big deal. Not for me. 
There's no big, no big deal. Don't ever get that confused with Jesus, that Jesus is wrestling the devil and he's not gonna make it. He doesn't know he, Jesus created everything with a breath, including all the angels, the fallen angels, the demon world, the chaos world. He, he creates all of that and he holds it in the sovereignty of his hands and he has it under control. And yet Jesus here, the disciples said, why couldn't we do it? He said, oh yeah, this kind, this kind only comes out through prayer and fasting. Most of you who've been around the scriptures for a while have studied this portion of scripture and you know what Jesus is alluding to. That when this type of warfare arises, when this type of difficulty shows up, if you haven't been already living and leading a life of prayer and fasting, you're going to be outgunned. You're gonna be outdone. I'll say it in a way that's a little more negative. It's too late in that moment to be ready for the fight that's at your doorstep if you're not living a lifestyle of prayer and fasting. If you're not living a lifestyle of preparedness and readiness, if you're not ready for the warfare, and again, I love good days and sunny days and fun days, but the devil has a calendar of attack on your life. He knows what he's bringing. He knows what's next for you, what temptation, what pitfall, what difficulty. And when those days come to you, the Bible says, and Jesus confirms that you and I have to be ready through a lifestyle of praying and fasting. So that way, when things get crazy, we're not caught off guard. Now, I don't know what was going on. Maybe these boys were disillusioned, the nine of them. Jesus took his favorites, Peter, James, and John, up to the mountain of transfiguration. Another field trip for Jesus' favorites. The elites are gone, and maybe these guys were all bummed out down below, and they weren't praying and fasting. I could totally understand that. Can't you guys understand that? Like, man, this is dumb. This is tough. Jesus had to watch the stuff. I'm watching the stuff, and all of a sudden, a demon shows up, and they're in a fight. Like, ah! Should have been ready. And I don't want to live in that fear of the unknown, but I do want to live in a response of being responsible for the reality of the world we live in. So we would be ready in and out of season. Seasoned and set apart with grace because we don't know what's, as a matter of fact, we do know what's ahead of us. There's difficulty on every single corner. See, we get in this mindset living in this life right now that the new iPhone update's coming out and the new phone and high-speed internet and the ducks are undefeated and it's just good everywhere, you know? It's just good. Everything's good. And we find ourselves taking off our armor and not getting up early before the sun rises to do the psalmatic progression, to read through the scriptures, to not do the five-by-five five reading and to not go to life. We find ourselves, it's just, life's good at times. Careful. It's in those moments that the Bible teaches us and life has repeated, those are the times we've gotta be packing away the principles of spirituality, growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus and being ready in and out of season. And I believe it's a wake-up call for all of us in 2024, it's an election year. Hopefully you guys are all prayed up. Hopefully you guys are registered to vote. Hopefully you guys are seeing what's going on. There's a heightened sensitivity and awareness right now. I don't know if you guys were driving around Newport yesterday. There's hundreds of people, I wouldn't say protesting, but with their signs. You know, this is crazy times right now. Now's not the time to let off the gas pedal and kind of eat, cruise over into the easy lane and I'll just do less spiritual things and less awareness and less all, don't do that. Don't be taking your armor off. Now's the time and I believe that Jesus is saying that to these guys, hey, this kind doesn't come out except through a lifestyle of prayer and fasting. Now prayer is where we attach ourselves to the Lord. We become more close to him, more aware of him, more available to him. Fasting is where we detach ourselves from the world. And the world is so clingy. The world's so attractive. The world's so available to us. The Lord says, be careful. The things of this world are fading away. You're not taking any of this stuff to heaven with you. Don't become so worldly minded. It's not a bad thing to fast from time to time from food or from entertainment or from some of these things to set our attention and affection more so on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe these guys were getting this tremendous lesson. And Jesus wants us to have that same lesson as well. I believe also, I wouldn't call this a failure, maybe I would. I believe this failure was important for them. Don't raise your hands, but how many of you guys like to fail? Like to come up short, like to blow it? I don't, but I do it all the time. It's like I do like it or something. And the Lord uses failures, he uses mistakes, he uses shortcomings to get our attention. He uses it to get us back to a place of teachability. Maybe you're here right now and you've made a mistake recently. Maybe things just aren't right where you need to be. Oh, what do I do? Bring them to me. Bring your stuff to Jesus. 
Bring your singleness to Jesus. Maybe your singleness is all out of control. Lord, I haven't been living the life I'm supposed to live. I haven't been giving my heart over to you. Maybe your marriage is out of control. Maybe your parenting is out of control. Maybe your finances are out of control. Maybe your spirituality is out of control. Maybe there's a sin issue, a secret thing going on. It's out of control. And the Lord says, hey, hey, how's that going? Uh, uh, not good. Okay, well, bring it to me. Bring it to me right now. And I'm gonna have the worship team come up and they're gonna lead us in a closing song. We're gonna do that right now. I've got some oil in my pocket. I'd like to pray for you. We're gonna have some prayer people come up also and pray. And it's an opportunity for us to simply respond and say, Lord, man, thank you for going up to the mountain of transfiguration. Thank you for doing what you did and showing us your glory. And as we walk down the mountain, right now we're in the valley. This is where the battles are going on right now. And what you and I get the opportunity to do is to armor up to put the gospel of feet on or boots on and to put the breastplate of righteousness, that belt of truth, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, the helmet of salvation. As a matter of fact, let's all stand up and the lights will be turned down low. We're gonna say a prayer and ask God to minister to us now as we sing and respond. And here's my prayer for us, is that the Lord would make us a spiritual people. He'd give us spiritual minds, the mind of Christ, that we wouldn't be tossed to and fro in these dark days where the world has gone woke, where the world has gone anti-Christ. This is what it says in the gospel of the first John. It says that the world, the anti-Christ spirit's already here. And we're to find ourselves founded upon the rock that is higher than I. I'm gonna make this very simple. If you would ask the Lord like this dad did for compassion and mercy. Lord, would you have compassion on me? Lord, would you have compassion on my, my stuff? Lord, would you heal? Would you deliver? And it might even be beyond your help, beyond your hope. You're like, it looks like it's dead. I don't even know what's going on, but I'm gonna give it to the Lord. I need the Lord to resurrect this thing in my life, to change me, to give me that joy again, to take not his Holy Spirit from me, but to lead me in the things of God. Lord, I want that restoration. If you're here this morning and you need the Lord's compassion and mercy and you believe, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief restore that which the enemy has taken. An enemy, would you get out and never come back in Jesus' name? Never come back. We don't want your kind here. We don't want your ways here. We want the light of God in our lives. And we ask that in Jesus' name, we draw near to the Lord and we resist the devil. And if you need these things to happen in your life, would you just raise up your hand right now? Just say, yeah, I need these things to happen in my life. I want you, Lord, to take over. I need compassion. Lord, I need mercy and restoration and deliverance. My hand is up as well, Jesus. Equip us for the battle ahead, Lord. Deliver us from the carnage around us and let your light shine upon us. We thank you, Jesus, for all you've done. You can put your hands down. During this time of singing, if you need to come to the altar, you can do so and kneel. If you need to come and pray, there's prayer people coming up on my left and right, John and Lucy and some others. And Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, you would set us free right now as we respond to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come forward. If you need prayer, let's sing together.